ഭൂതൂതരായ കാലകാലകാലേശ്വരായ ശിവ ശിവ സർവേശ്വരായ ശംഭ ശംഭ മഹാദേവായ trapped you here transcription the little boy and girl by conscription hmm you you want to come Are you okay? Yes. Now. Where is now, please? If you raise your hands. It's… Uh, there's too much feedback to me. Uh, it's okay? most beautiful thing about time is
If you do something, it passes by. If you do nothing, it passes by. If you're joyful, it passes by. If you're miserable, it passes by. It's absolutely just, no matter who you are, how you are, for everybody it passes at the same speed. Only thing is, our experience of the time could be different depending upon how intensely we live or how slack we are. If you're very slack with life, it looks like time is passing by very slowly. If you're very intense, time just flies by. But in reality, time is happening to all of us at the same pace. These cycles of time <clears throat> whether it's minutes or hours or days, months or years that go by, these cycles of time <clears throat> anything that's cyclical is naturally repetitive but anything that is cyclical also has a centrifuge or a centrifugal force, a force which is always trying to go away at a tangent from the circle. If you ride this centrifugal force of time, we say you are spiritual. If you are caught up in the cycle of time, then that's being material. If you are crushed by the cycles of time, then we say you are a suffering creature. It is the same cycle. Either you can be crushed by the cycle or you can be trapped in the cycle or you can ride the cycle. To ride the cycles of time, not to be trapped in it, definitely not to be crushed by it. Time is a crushing experience for a lot of people. Hmm? Yes? <coughs> Anything cyclical, has this ability that it can crush you or it can trap you or you can ride it. In the yogic way of looking at things, we see time. Time is referred to as kala. Kala be, means both time and space. Kala means darkness. Darkness means that which does not stop light. You understand? I'm sorry. If there is light going by, you won't see it. Only if it's stopped by something, you see it. So that which does not stop light, is called darkness. So, that which does not stop light is empty space. So both space and time are referred to as color because they are not seen as two different entities. Only because there is time, space is possible. Because there is time, you can move from point A to point B, so there is space. 
if there was no time, there was no way to move. The general perception is that because there is space, there is time. But I don't see it that way. Because there is time, there is space. Now, <clears throat> there is time which happens because of cycles. The planet spins once, it's a day. The moon goes around the planet, it's a month. The planet goes around the sun, here we are today. <clears throat> the cycles of time are one dimension of time. There's another dimension of time which is not… which is beyond the cyclical nature. This we call as the great time, it's called the Mahakala. There is time and there is greater time. Even when there are no cycles, there is time. But where there is no cyclical movement, there is no physical happening. Everything that's physical in the universe, from what is atomic to what is cosmic, everything is cyclical. If there are no cycles happening, there is no physical possible. When I said, if you take a tangent or if you take the centrifugal to ride away from the cycles of time, that means being spiritual, it's in this context that we know the cycles of time only because of physical reality. If we could measure, if we could measure, what is the speed of an electron around the proton or neutron? We could keep time, atomic time, a bit too much for us. So we measured the planets, how much time it takes to go around the sun. We said it's a year. We went little further down to days and hours and minutes and seconds. But all of them are cycles of the physical existence. If there is no physical existence, we would not know anything that's cyclical. If we did not know what is cyclical moment, we would not know the cyclical nature of the time. But before existence manifested in its physical nature, there was time. This is called Mahakala, that is, an eternal space. You're not watching my words. I'm saying an eternal space. When there was no movement, when everything was still, there was time but nothing cyclical happening. That dimension of time into which everything dissolved and from which everything sprang up, when certain energy touched it, it took to cyclical moment. When cyclical moment happened, physical happened. When physical happened, we could measure time. Otherwise, time was just space. So the word kala means both time and space. Sadhguru, we came for a party <laughs> I 
and here you're going at us like this. This is, it is important to know or rather it's important to touch and experience a dimension which is not cyclical in nature. Because what is cyclical is inevitably repetitive. What is cyclical inevitably runs itself out at some play, at some point. It runs itself down. Anything that's cyclical cannot be forever because it needs a certain amount of kinetic energy which is going to expand itself. When a human being touches a, touches a dimension which is not cyclical in nature, suddenly there is a new quality a quality which is beyond all qualities, not good, not bad, not this, not that, simply like existence. There's nothing high about it, nothing low about it. It's just that you have moved from the surface to the source. Not that it solves all your problems, it's just that you won't know what is a problem. This… I said something about the India situation and this court is making rounds, even reached the Prime Minister and he was laughing about it. I said, for every solution there is a problem <laughs> Just see <laughs> for every solution somebody has a problem, isn't it <laughs> For… people may think for every problem there is a solution, but when you don't see any problems, when you see only solutions, some people have problems with the solutions <clears throat> I don't know. What shall I do? What shall I do with myself? Which is all and nothing at once. What shall I do with myself? Which is me and you at once. What shall I do? Is this a problem or is this a solution? There may be a space where there are no problems and no solutions, just existence. For someone who pops out of nothing and pops out into nothing, what is a problem and what is a solution, I'm asking <laughs> Hello? You popped up from nothing, you're going to pop out into nothing. In this little space and time, what is the problem and what is the solution? I want you to figure this out <laughs> Hello? What is the problem? Huh? There's really no problem, no solution actually, but there are so many problems <laughs> Sadhguru, we don't know where you are living. 
where I am living there are so many problems. <laughs> I am also living among the kind of people that you are living with. Yes, same sort. <laughs> the question is just, what are you rooted into? If your rooting is just your physical body, some things are problems, some things are solutions. If you're rooted into your psychological framework, everything is a problem. <laughs> if you're rooted into the existence, nothing is a problem, nothing is a solution. Everything is an experience of life. Hmm? Everything is an experience. If I die tomorrow, that is also a very good experience. <laughs> we don't wish it tomorrow, but if it comes, that is also an experience. No? You don't like it. Whether you like it or not, it happens, you know. Yes? Whether you like it or not, it happens. Not that we are wishing it tomorrow, but if it happens tomorrow, what the hell? We don't want it tomorrow. We still got miles to go before I sleep, miles to go before I sleep <laughs> We don't know how many miles you will go, but if you look at life in its full depth and dimension, life is a certain amount of space. If you look at life in a linear fashion, life is a certain amount of time. If you look at life from your psychological perspective, life is a certain number of problems. Every day, I'm meeting all sorts of people, thousands of them. How many varieties of problems they have means is unbelievable. For sure, for every solution there is a problem. <laughs> Birth is a problem, death is a problem, in between series of problems. Serial inventors of problems. One cycle is ending. A new year is coming. It's a choice that you have to make. Are you going to invest your thought and emotion and energy in making up problems or making up solutions or simply enjoying life for what it is? It's a choice that one has to make. Oh, this is my resolution, I won't make any more problems <laughs> To make resolutions, first you need a constitution. Do you have a constitution? Hello? You don't have a constitution? No, like a nation has a constitution. A religion has a constitution too. One advantage with the constitution of the nation is we can amend it periodically. The constitution of the religions cannot be amended, it's fixed. <laughs> Any change means violence will happen. <laughs> if you suggest an amendment, they will kill you. That is their amendment <laughs> The 
the national constitution, constitutions which make nations, it is open to debate and amendment. I'm asking you, you as a person, do you have a constitution? No, 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 you have. <laughs> what you like, what you don't like, this is what I will do, this is what I will do. I am a morning person, I am a evening person. <laughs> I'm a WhatsApp person, I'm a email person, I'm a Facebook person. <laughs> there are constitutions, individual constitutions, maybe not written down, but it's there, isn't it? If you can pass a resolution, there must be a constitution. If there is no constitution, how do you pass a resolution about it? So there is… Once you have a constitution, you are not a life, you are an institution. If you are living in an institution, you know what it means. It means you are a nutcase. Yes. No, 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 not everybody. Either you are a nutcase or you are a spiritual aspirant. Yes. You are a seeker of sanity or you are a seeker of liberation. One of these things means you live in an institution. So, what resolution should I take for the new year? All resolutions are impositions. Where there is no consciousness, where there is no awareness to know life, from the line of… from the aliveness of what it is, you want to fix it. If you pass a resolution today, in some way you're making sure that you will not be aware for the next one year, because awareness means a spontaneous response to life, moment to moment. As a resolution means fixed, prefixed. If you prefix your life, whether it's done by you or done by somebody else, if… if your government passes a resolution, all of you must hang upside down. In India, we would say a tamarind tree. Here, where shall we hang you from? What's the famous tree from which they hang people? No particular tree? Hmm? Where to find an oak tree? Where to find a big oak tree to hang from? It's difficult to find them. In India we say a tamarind tree for a particular reason. <laughs> so let's say your government passes a resolution that all of you should hang upside down from a tree, whatever tree. We'll give you the choice of the tree. Will you suffer this? Will you protest this? Will you rebel against it or no? Hmm? Yes. Whether your government passes the resolution or you pass the resolution, it's not any different. You're trying to achieve something by force. Anything that you try to do by force feels like you're hanging upside down. Yes sir? You want to be like this but you want to do this, you will feel like you're hanging upside down. When you hang upside down, you will feel like rebelling against it. 
So naturally within three days your resolutions will become dissolutions. <laughs> Otherwise, you suffer hanging upside down. Where if you suffer the entire year, some will dissolve this in three days, some in three weeks, some in three months. But the very fact that they need one more resolution by the year end is a proof that it not, did not last the year. So there is no need to take any resolutions. But a resolution is made because you want to do something that you naturally don't… not incline towards. But a simple thing is, are you inclined to be joyful or miserable? That was only five people <laughs> Are you naturally inclined to be joyful or miserable? The little ones? So, you can consciously, you can make an attempt to be conscious that joyful is na my natural inclination. So how joyful will I be in the coming year? Just keep accounts. Hmm? See, a lot of people who are doing business, they think they're keeping accounts only for the sake of IRS. <laughs> no, no. You keep accounts not for the sake of IRS, because if you do not keep accounts, you do not know whether you're making profit or loss. That's the idea of accounts, isn't it? Whether you're moving forward or backward, to know this, you need an account book. Why don't you keep an account book? At the end of the day, just check, am I a little more joyful today than yesterday? If you had done this since you were five years of age, you would have been ecstatic by now, profit side. became like this because you never kept accounts. One day you checked when it became very acute, then you see you're in a big loss. Every day, every month, just keep accounts. Am I becoming more joyful or less joyful? There are only two things. How joyful are you and how much joy do you give to people around you? This you can keep accounts, hmm? If you keep accounts of this, people are keeping accounts of their money as if they're going to carry it with them. The real wealth of life is how joyful you are, how wonderful is your experience of life. Joy is not a goal by itself, but it's a necessary ambience for life. If you don't set this one ambience, then whatever you have is just going waste. Hmm? You may have health, that's going waste, because there are more people on this planet who are healthy and miserable than unhealthy and miserable. At least if you're… at least if you're unhealthy, you got a good enough excuse for your misery, hmm? You're healthy and miserable, there is no excuse. I want you to just understand this. It's just not smart to be miserable. This happened. A lady was driving and then she had a flat tire. She had never really done this, this changing tire business. 
But she read the instruction manual, she put the jack and lifted up the car, she undid the wheel. With great difficulty she pulled out the heavy wheel from the boot and was trying to fix it and these four nuts that she had. She had kept it in the hubcap and with her high heels she was struggling and she stepped on the hubcap and all the four nuts flew in different directions. So she put the new tire, but she had no nuts. Then she was cursing and wondering and miserable, what the hell to do now? And she was a little nervous because she was hearing all kinds of noises from a mental institution which was across the street. <laughs> then on the third floor, there was a young man looking out of the window, watching this lady. Then he said, hey lady, look here, all you need to do is take one one nut out of the three wheels and put the three nuts on this, you can drive to the gas station. With three nuts you can drive, no problem. She did that and she got the car down on the road. Then she looked up at him and said, you're so smart, why are you here? He said, I may be nuts, but I'm not stupid <laughs> It's all right to be little crazy, but you don't have to be stupid. All the so-called smart people who become like they're practicing a posture for their grave, you know? When I look at a lot of people, I think they're practicing <laughs> and they're doing pretty well. <laughs> but what they don't understand is, it doesn't take practice. <laughs> when you die, it happens. <laughs> yes? You do think you need to practice? No. Because you can't improve death with practice but you can improve life with practice, yes or no? Yes. However you do life, you can still do it better, yes? yes? But death happens super efficiently for everybody, you can't improve upon that. You think you can improve? No. You don't have to practice your final posture right now. It'll come naturally, believe me. It's not like life, there are no difficulties there. It'll come very naturally, you will do perfectly well in the grave. You don't have to have any doubt, you doesn't need any preparation. When you die, you will get it. Hmm? But now with life, there is so much to do and more. How much ever you do, there's something more to do about life, isn't it? If you want to be at it, the fundamental ambience is that you're joyful. Otherwise, you will get this tremendously intelligent, idiotic question, to be or not to be <laughs> Yes. Intellectually seems very profound, but it's the most idiotic question. You don't have to decide not to be, it will happen. There were many idiots like you, countless number of idiots like you on this planet who are gone. They don't have to worry about to be or not to be now. Anyway, they are not to be. This is our time on this planet, yes? yes? This is our time on this planet. What are we going to do? That's a question. Are we going to make this into an exuberant, joyful, wonderful planet 
or we're going to make this into a miserable, horrible planet. This is our time, we are free to do either way. The choice is yours, I won't tell you, take a resolution that you will make this into a wonderful planet. There is no such thing. The natural inclination of life is for pleasantness. If you choose to be very pleasant within yourself, pleasant things will happen. If you're feeling horrible within you and you try to do wonderful things, then I want you to understand the worst tyrants on the planet. Those who top the baddie list historically, I'll pick up the worst of the lot. You take somebody like Adolf Hitler or Benito Mussolini, they really believed they are going to create a wonderful world. You know this? They had a dream of an ideal world. When you have horrible things going within you and you go at the world with… very energetically, what you will create is a horrendous reality. Before you touch the world, if you want to clean somebody's face, your hands must be clean, isn't it? Yes or no? Your hands are not clean, you try to touch this, this is not going to work. So before you touch the outside world, this much you must do to with yourself, that you are pleasant. When you are pleasant, whatever you touch will become pleasant. You are unpleasant, but you have good intentions, it is no good. I want you to understand, right now in the world, one situation that is happening in certain parts of the world, which almost everybody in the world sees as the most horrible things that can happen, they believe they are creating God's own kingdom. Yes or no? They one hundred percent believe. You may question their intelligence, you cannot question their integrity because they're willing to die for it. When a man is willing to die for something, you cannot question his integrity, isn't it? You can question his intelligence and judgment, but you cannot question his integrity because when I stake my life, you must know, I mean it, isn't it? I am not playing fool with it, it means more to me than my life. Yes or no? I want you to know, you have anger and hatred going within you, but you want to create a wonderful world. What happens, the consequence of that is a horrendous reality. It's not by intention that the world will change. It is by your consciousness that the world will change, how you are within yourself. If we don't fix this one thing, we will have intentions and intentions. The worst things have happened on the planet with good intentions, not with bad intentions. Yes or no? The most horrendous things have happened with very good intentions. So what intention you have is not important. What is your inner nature? This is important. Every action that human beings are doing in their life, knowingly or unknowingly, is in pursuit of their well-being. And you know you feel well only when you're joyful. Hello? Yes? You feel really well only when you're happy and joyful, isn't it? Or in other words, every single action that human beings perform is in pursuit of their happiness or joy. If they were joyful by their own nature, every action that you perform would become conscious instead of being compulsive, isn't it? This is all you have to do to yourself. This year, the coming year and the coming, coming year and for the rest of your life, you just have to keep accounts. 
from yesterday to today, am I a little more joyful? Am I… you don't even have to worry about giving joy, if you are joyful, you will spread joy, yes? Will you keep accounts, I'm asking? Or shall I set IRS upon you? <laughs> Do you need enforcement? Most societies have been run for a long time by enforcement. So if there is nobody to enforce, <laughs> no, that's not what happens. If there is nobody to enforce anything, you become joyful, isn't it? <laughs> I want you to understand this, <laughs> the difference between a resolution and moving towards the natural inclination of life. If there is nobody enforcing anything upon you, do you become miserable or joyful? So, you don't have to enforce any resolutions upon yourself, just little tools to make sure that you don't sink, just keeping accounts daily. Every day before you go to bed, you must check whether you're little more joyful today than yesterday, okay? If you keep this up, by the time you're thirty, you will be ecstatic. <laughs> when I was… <laughs> when I was just twenty-five, I simply sat down with my eyes closed, every cell in my body was dripping ecstasy, nameless ecstasies. Then I realized this is it, nothing to be done. If you don't mess with your mind, you're ecstatic. The fool that I was, I made a plan. In two and a half to three years' time, I'm going to make the entire world ecstatic because there's nothing to do. If you simply sit here, you know, Thirty-five years <laughs> I have not lost it. A few people have gotten it. Yes, quite a few people have gotten it, but still not the world. <laughs> Making some estimates and on an average, in the last three years' time, we should be touching nearly hundred million people a year. But still, that's not the world. No, 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 don't… don't… don't enjoy my failures <laughs> My idea of the world is 7.3 billion people. Hundred million is not a success. It looks like I'm destined to die a failure, but I'll die a blissful failure because me being blissful is not dependent upon the results of my actions. <laughs> my actions are rooted in my blissfulness. This is how life needs to be conducted that your actions are rooted in your joyfulness and blissfulness, that joy is not a result of something that you do. The moment it is a result of something that you do, it will fly away in no time because our actions in the world not always are they successful, hmm? However well you do it, Yes or no? However well you do it, not always are they successful. Our actions are subject to various realities. Many forces have to come together for the success of any action. Not always they will fall together. So if your joy, if your way of being is enslaved to the success of your activity, 
then you being joyful is a very remote possibility. And above all, what will happen is, when you perform actions, if they don't succeed, if you are going to become miserable, after a couple of burns, then you will shrink. You will see how to restrict your life to minimal activity so that you will enjoy maximum success. If you cripple yourself, you know, if you cripple yourself, you can participate in a race with people, suppose you have only one leg, then you participate in a race with somebody who does not have both the legs and of course you win. This is what most people are trying to do. The moment there is fear of suffering, of failure, what you will do is cripple yourself, restrict your activity. Only when failure doesn't matter, that you can go through your failure blissfully, you will do everything that you can do. Who cares whether it happens or not? We will do it and we'll do it well. If it happens, it's great. If it doesn't happen, it's very great because we can do it all over again. Joy is not a consequence of life or activity of life. Joy is a natural ambience which is necessary if you have to… Tomorrow morning if you have to wake up and want to do something, you, know, you need to have some joy in you. Otherwise, to be or not to be <laughs> Will it come or not? Suppose you wake up and you tomorrow morning you're bereft of joy, nothing in you. You'll wonder, why am I here? Yes or no? One day, one twenty-four hours completely joyless, will you wonder, what the hell am I doing here? Yes or no? Because this is the nature of life. If this life has to s blossom, it needs the ambience of joy. So, we have given you the tools <laughs> to live joyfully. You must keep accounts. Hmm? Yes. I got it <laughs> Before they serve food and music is ready and a party is ready, I don't want to take any more time. If there is a question that you can't go into the new year without being answered, if there is such a question, okay? <laughs> Not that you must ask a question, if there is such a question, okay? No, it works only if you speak. Karam Sadhguru, mm -hmm. I have uh, thousands of burning questions, but uh, I thank you immensely for giving me this opportunity to ask one question. Um, how do I get rid of some unconscious bad habits in my life? When I see that I have overcome some of those bad habits, I see that it comes back again in my life. How do I just totally get rid of this and become free out of it? So you must understand that, please. 
there is no such thing as good habit and bad habit. All habits are bad <laughs> Because habit means you're unconscious. You think only bad habits are unconscious? No. Even the so-called good habits, habit means you have learned to function in an automated way. That means you don't do things consciously. For example, is brushing your teeth in the morning a good habit or a bad habit? <laughs> Even you, I thought you would be free from a habit. <laughs> there are two ways of brushing your teeth. Because you've been regimented to brush your teeth, you get up and <laughs> Or because you wake up, you're very sensitive, if you open your mouth, you're conscious enough. <laughs> Most of the time you're not conscious enough, only other people know. This is a very strange thing. There is the apparatus, the olfactory apparatus, which smell, which have a sense of smell right here above your mouth. But you don't get it, others get it five feet away. That means you're unconscious, isn't it? Yes? If you're conscious, you would still brush your teeth till you come to such a place when you open your mouth in the morning, it smells like fragrance, you become like a flower. Till that happens, you must consciously brush. If you consciously brush, on different days or different mornings, it may need different length or different amount of brushing. Not every day brushing is same requirement, but because you're regimented three minutes, I must wear my teeth out <laughs> If you were conscious, on a particular day you would brush as it is necessary for that day. That's how it should be. On a particular day, you would eat as it is necessary for the body. You would sleep as it is necessary for the body. You would do everything consciously, but now it's a habit. Everything is a habit. What time you should go to bed, what time you should wake up, what you should eat, what you should not eat, everything by prescription. This is called slavery. Your doctor tells you or your slave master tells you what you should eat today. I don't see what's the difference. Why is it that you do not know what this body needs today? Because no consciousness, everything by regimentation, by habit. Habit is regimentation, isn't it? It's only by regimentation you become habitual. So in this, you have also identified something as good habit and something as bad habit, what to do? Is there something called as bad unconsciousness and good unconsciousness? That's what you're saying. When you say, I have a good habit, you are saying, I am unconscious in a nice way. <laughs> it's like say saying, I am dead in a nice way <laughs> Because the fundamental difference between being alive and being dead is being conscious and being totally unconscious. Being partially unconscious is being partially dead. As I earlier told you, you're trying to practice the posture <laughs> and the state of what it means to be dead. Do not fix any kind of habit. Just see, see the idea 
of withdrawing into retreats, coming to your spiritual space, is just this, to find space where you can do everything consciously. When you were in a race, you could not be conscious, you got mad and you somehow fixed some habits through which you managed to go through your daily office routine. When you come to a spiritual space, this is what you're supposed to do, that you watch what is the requirement of your body, what is the requirement of your mind, what is the requirement of your emotion, what is the requirement of your energy, what does this life need? What does it naturally long for? To consciously watch this. Once you consciously know that this is what it is longing for, then there is no two ways about it. Otherwise you think you are on the spiritual path because of me, that's a crime against me <laughs> Yes <laughs> If you are unconscious, it's a crime against yourself. But you are doing something that you think is spiritual because of me, that's a crime against me. You better do crime against yourself, not against me <laughs> So, how do I get rid of habits? You don't have to get rid of habits. It is like, what you're asking is, how do I get rid of my unconsciousness? When you use the word un, we are suggesting a non-existence, not an existence, isn't it? Consciousness is. When consciousness is not there, that is called unconsciousness. How to get rid of something that does not exist? I'm saying you're playing a trick with yourself. It's like, suppose this… this hall is dark. How to get rid of this darkness? Kick it out. Hmm? All of you together, I'm sure you can kick out the darkness you will get into a, an insane effort. You've been on it. Hmm? This insane effort to get rid of unconsciousness. No, to get rid of darkness, you just have to light it up. If you light it up, darkness is gone because darkness is not an existence by itself, it's just the absence of light. Similarly, unconsciousness is not an existence of itself. It is just absence of consciousness. If you become conscious, do you have to fight with unconscious? Huh? If you are conscious, do you have to fight with unconscious habits? No. So you need to work on consciousness to become conscious. Oh, what should I do? You should not do unconscious things <laughs> because the essence of life is being conscious. You know that you're alive only because you're reasonably conscious, isn't it? Yes or no? Yes. You're fast asleep. Do you know you're dead or alive? Do you know? No. Why? Because you're not conscious. When you're not conscious, you do not even know whether you're dead or alive, isn't it? Now you know that you're alive because you're somewhat conscious. Now we just have to raise the wick a little bit to become more conscious. That's what we're working on. There are many things which has gathered inertia, your physical body. That's why the 5.30 drum in the morning, your mind has got into its own habitual patterns. That's why me torturing you with all this. Your energies have followed the requirement of body and mind and they've gotten into their own patterns. That is why the sadhana, the idea is to break the cycles of unconsciousness and become conscious. When you become conscious, it looks like you're in unknown terrain. Suddenly everything seems to be difficult. When you were going habitually, it looked like everything was easy. But 
See, when I <laughs> when I went into the Coimbatore prison, no, I went there unqualified, okay <laughs> When I went there to conduct a program, <laughs> almost twenty-five, twenty-four, twenty-five years ago, I just observed, this is something a whole lot of people are seeking in their life, prison life. Because this is a place where somebody always opens the doors for you and they close it for you, they turn off the lights for you. They do everything for you, you don't have to do anything, really. Food comes a bang on time, <laughs> always. By the second, I'm telling you, time means food is ready. Everything is great in this prison, I thought this is a great place. Only thing is it's enforced. But this is what a whole lot of people are seeking, systems in their life. Yes? When it is done to you, you will suffer it, I'm telling you. When it, it… when it is done to you, you will suffer it. Actually, for a whole lot of people, prison life is far more… it is far more organized than what they dream of in their life. It's far more efficient, far more nutritious and most of them are very fit and healthy. But. If you enter the prison, there is suffering in the air. Not once I've been there hundreds of times to various prisons. Not once have I stepped out of the prison without tears in my eyes because there is suffering in the air. The pain in the air is unbearable. Because one thing that a human being suffers most is lack of freedom. Not lack of comfort, not lack of wealth, not lack of this and that. Once freedom is taken away, a human being suffers immensely. Everything is correct. Prison life is far more comfortable than going to work and coming back, getting stuck in the traffic, going through all these problems. You are a state guest, you know <laughs> Really, if you're looking for a comfortable, no surprises kind of life, <laughs> if you suffer every little thing, sh everything shocks you, everything makes you go through stress and tension, prison life is perfect. Everything is in order, no surprises. Everything is just right. Even the menu is written down, next seven days, what's the menu? It's there and it goes by that, nothing more, nothing more, nothing less. One bean more means somebody will be taken to task. Everything is correct. Those who are looking for a correct life, prison is the best place. But a human being will suffer immensely when everything is correct. Yes or no? Everything is correct, but no freedom. People will suffer this immensely. So you need to understand, habit means you have caused a little prison of your own and you will suffer this after some time. Initially it looks like efficiency, after some time it is imprisonment. Prison is in many ways an epitome of efficiency, isn't it? But efficiency is not what this life is looking for. This life is looking for expansion. This life wants the freedom to expand always. I was talking to one of this management specialists from America, a very well-known man, let me not mention the names. So, he was propounding all his management principles which are… which look like a prison cell to me. Bringing order to everything so that it's efficient. 
See, there are two ways of looking at this. There is a manicured garden which looks very perfect. There is forest which looks like chaos. But the manicured garden, if you don't manage it for one month, it's finished. There's no garden left. A forest has managed itself for a million years and still going on. Which is more efficient? Which is more orderly? Forest is far more orderly and far more efficient, but it is not fitting into your logical framework, that's all. This is what enlightenment means that from being a manicured garden, you become a forest. Because it sustains upon itself, it doesn't need anything from outside. Nobody need to water it, nobody need to manure it, nobody need to come and trim it, everything happens within itself. Yes or no? If you leave it for a million years, it'll still be there. Only if you meddle with it, it may go away. Otherwise, it will sustain itself because it is an efficiency of chaos. We call something chaos not because it is inefficient, we call something chaos because it doesn't fit into our logical framework. So habit means you have become a slave of your own logic. And after some time, the moment you form a habit, it is unconscious, isn't it? So what you need to get rid of is not habits, you have to become conscious. If you become more conscious and you're not unconscious, then there is no such thing as habit. You will do what's right for you now. So. 999 questions. Please live with it for 2017. <laughs> All the best. Namaskaram <laughs> Sadhguru. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I have a question uh, regarding the book and um, I wanted to know like if we read the book as I've read it and I'm doing the practices, the practices in the book, how do they help versus the programs that we have and if someone's reading the book and doing the practices, is that enough or what is it that they need to do next? What did I do to deserve that? Huh? Huh? What's your name? Shashi. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh. 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 Ho, 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 ho. Isn't it a bit too early for flowers? Hmm? <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. These are slippers for in the airplane. Oh, I must wear them on the airplane? Mm -hmm. I usually don't walk, I fly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hmm? Thank you very much. You're <laughs> I'm sorry? Can I please say a poem? Oh, yes, please. Can I have a microphone? Microphone, please. <laughs> There's a poem that they're going to recite. My heart is like a singing bird whose nest is in a watered shoot. My heart is like an apple tree whose boughs are bent with thick set fruit. My heart is like a rainbow shell that paddles in the Holstein Sea. My heart is gladder than all these because my love has come to me. Raise me days of silk and down, carved in 
peacocks and doves and pe pomegranates and peacocks with 100 eyes, work it in gold and silver grapes and leaves and silver flirty, flirty lists because the birthday of my life has come. My love has come to me. <laughs> what a sweet one. Sorry. <laughs> you know, we washed away by… we lost the question, you know. Okay, okay, okay practice is practice. Is. <laughs> lovely. I get, if I get to do that, that would be amazing. <laughs> I'm sorry? <laughs> that was lovely, the kids getting to hug huh? you was amazing. <laughs> what is that? The kids getting to hug you was amazing, you know, so it's okay. <laughs> but you don't have a sweet poem like her. I know. Oh, when you said the book, you know, I'm supposed to finish this book before third of January, so I'm working on that book. When you said the book, I was just thinking, book, 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 because this book is bothering me for the last few days, I'm supposed to complete it by third January <laughs> We're writing a book on Adi Yogi. I'm to give it to the publisher by third January. And so that's a book on my mind. You're talking about the old book. <laughs> old book. Okay. <laughs> the practice that is taught in the inner engineering program needs twenty-one minutes. You need to sit in one place and do it. It is of a different nature. It is it is a process which can change to start with the chemistry of your system. Many of you have experienced this. After a few months of practice, if you look back and see all those little, little things which were so significant don't seem to bother you anymore, they're just gone simply because the chemistry has changed. You know when chemistry changes, things change <laughs> In whatever way you have known it, but there are other dimensions to human chemistry that instead of being a volatile, reactive chemistry, can become a very self-contained chemistry which is pleasant and on. The practices in the book are not sitting down and doing practices, you could be doing it anywhere. You could be driving, you could be working in your office, you could be walking on the street and still be doing it. They are of that nature or in other words, the practices in the book are just to bring a certain amount of consciousness. The book did not have these practices to start with, but when I traveled around in America, everybody was tr talking about being mindful. <laughs> then I saw by being mindful what they will do to themselves. My entire work is to bring you to a certain sense of abandon that you can be here like you're not here. If you sit here, 
you don't even know whether your body is here. If you sit like this, first thing is you don't have a gender. You don't even have a body, so where is the question of a gender? If you simply sit like this, there is no time for you. Just look at this. Only because you have a body, your body is keeping time, hmm? Your legs are telling you how long you've been sitting, yes or no? <laughs> huh? Suppose you had no legs, you would have no sense of time. If you had no back, no sense of time at all. If you had no body, no time at all, isn't it? Your body is keeping time. From womb to tomb, it is keeping time. From bathroom break to bathroom break, it is keeping time. From wake up to sleep, it is keeping time, yes or no? Once it's time, it'll do, ah. You don't have to look at the watch. Once a certain time is up, your body will do, ah. Yes or no? Right now, you've seen that old time machines with sand trickling away. Like that, the bladder is keeping time. Drop, drop, drop. As it fills up, you know what's the time. <laughs> Legs are keeping the time. If you've done your practices regularly, I mean the… the program practices, not the book practices. If you've done the program practices regularly, your legs can deceive time. Hmm? You… your legs don't know what's the time, your legs know. <laughs> book… book practice. So, the program practices are of a different nature that cannot be transmitted unless a certain amount of preparation and it's a transmission, it's not a teaching. Book is a teaching. There is a big difference between teaching and transmission. Do not mit misunderstand both as one. This is a way of creating a smaller step for people. Because people are not willing to take one big step, one small step, they read the book and if some small things change, they may take the program. But there is no substitute for sitting properly with eyes closed and doing what is being done properly. And not only that, there is no substitute for a transmission. If something is not transmitted, nothing new will happen. Improvement of the present will happen, nothing new will happen. With Shambhavi, we are not looking at improving you. We want something new to sprout in you. Something that was never there with you till that moment must happen within you, that's the intent. The book is trying to decorate the existing. existing. Whatever you are right now, to make a little improvement. Most people are looking for improvements in life. They are not looking for transformation. Transformation means nothing of the old should remain. That's transformation. But most people cling to the old. Will you leave 2016 or will you carry it with you? Can you? Though it leaves you, you will not leave it. 2016 will leave you, but you will not leave 2016, isn't it? Because you are a creature of memories. If you are a creature of memories, you are a creature of the past. That means you are a dinosaur which is extinct. <laughs> you become big because of your memories, isn't it? But you are extinct. What is the use? Dinosaur was a big creature, 
but doesn't exist. What is the use, I'm asking? Like this, if you live in your memory, you are big, but what is the use? What is needed is to reverberate with what is there now. Memory is good to handle the world. It's good only to handle the world. It's no good to handle this one, isn't it? You understand what I'm saying? Memory is good to handle the world around us. We need to remember what happened. What happened with this person, what happened with that person, what happened with that person, what happened with that situation and this situation, we need to remember. It is useful to address the world. But with your silly memory, you cannot address this one. It doesn't mean anything. This one you can address only with consciousness. There is no other way. Otherwise, you won't have this one. You have assembly of things. See, let me address something very sensitive. I want you to listen to this carefully, otherwise you will come to wrong conclusions. Let's say somebody very dear to you dies or they go away for some reason. You feel like you lost everything, yes or no? You feel like you lost everything because you are making up a life of substitution. Where you are not there, you filled it up with other people. When they go away, there is vacuum. But that's not how life is happening because you are there. Only because you are there, you can hold relationships with people, isn't it? Hello? But now in your experience, you are not there. Because you are a creature of memory, you can only remember this one and that one and that one. You can't remember this one. How can you remember this one? Because this is a current life. You cannot remember this one. Because you are handling everything by memory, you will see when one volume of memory, which was a certain person or a situation, if that goes away, it feels like life has come to an end. Simply because a certain amount of investment you have made in a certain amount of memory you have about a specific person. So if you live by memory, I'm saying, 2016 will leave you, but you will not leave 2016. If you don't leave 2016, how do you go to 2017? You cannot. You drag all these years and go into 2017, there's no such thing. You will be on a treadmill. You'll get the exercise, but you won't go anywhere. Tre treadmill. Is fine, the weather is bad, but it's not a vehicle to go somewhere. This much you must understand. Memory is a treadmill, yes? Memory is a treadmill. It is all right to handle situations around us, but you are not going to go anywhere with it. But. Human beings have invested so much in their memory, there's hardly a handful who will go with me on this one. I'm asking how many of you really want to step into 2017 fully, leaving 2016 behind? Whoa, 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 whoa. If you really, if really, really, I'm saying, if you can leave the past as past, completely, if you can sit here just in the present, no past, you're enlightened, you know, that's all it takes. It's the burden of the past which doesn't let you flower into your full possibility, just the burden of the past. 
So this is a good moment. This is not something that the planet is doing, okay? Yes, the solstice has just happened, that is there. But every day planet is spinning, every day it is moving in the trajectory of the planetary movement around the sun. You can choose any point to get enlightened, you don't have to wait for this point. Yes or no? <laughs> But anyway, we are at this point where somewhere in your mind you've been told it is significant. It's only significant because there is a memory of 2016. If there is no memory of 2016, in what way there is a 2017, there is no such thing? No, no, this is Sadhguru, you're confusing us. Sixteen, sixteen, seventeen. <laughs> it's correct, arithmetically correct. Yes, but only because there is memory, there is sixteen and there is seventeen, isn't it? So, if you know how to simply sit here, without being burdened by your memory, without being a product of memory, when I say product of memory, your likes, your dislikes, whom you love, whom you don't love, who is your friend, who is your enemy, all this comes because of your memory, isn't it? If you can keep all that aside and let the new year blossom, you will blossom into a wonderful creature, spraying fragrance into the world. Well, there won't be any attendant music, nor will there be an applause, but if really beautiful things happen, who cares whether it is appreciated by somebody or not <laughs> hey, Where is the attendant music? What happened to the musicians? Come on! Nothing so wonderful happened, so let's have some music <laughs> What? What is this? What did you say? <laughs> I have no such mission. It's for the parents to decide where they want to send their children. <laughs> huh? So what do you want to do with them, huh? Oh, you're thinking of starting a school here? Look at that one <laughs> She is a missionary, I'm not <laughs> Anyway, uh, just to tell you a few things, one thing is, on February twenty-fourth uh, is a once-in-a-lifetime kind of event for Isha, that we are unveiling this hundred and twelve feet tall face of Adi Yogi in Kwambator, in the Isha Yoga Center in India. It's going to be a massive campaign, particularly in India, but even internationally there will be a certain level of campaign. The fundamental idea is to use this iconic face as a galvanizing force, as I said, the book is getting ready, to use it as a galvanizing force to move people. It's a dangerous thing to say in Tennessee. <laughs> to move people from religion to responsibility. Why I'm saying this is, humanity has become like this. 
If small things go wrong in their life, they will find one little guy to blame because of him. If big things go wrong in their life, they'll find that big guy because of him. What about this guy? This guy is cent per year. That means in about fifteen to twenty years, almost all the rivers which have been perennial will become seasonal for variety of reasons. So uh, for the last three years I've been working on this and we've come up with a kind of a, a policy that the government has to take up. We've worked with a couple of state governments which they're already trying to implement. I've managed to convince two chief ministers and make this happen. I've recently put this across to the prime minister and he's agreed to this in principle. But to raise this awareness across the country because most people are unaware of it completely. So, and also, it's been a long time since I drove across the country. So, we're driving from Leh Ladakh, which is the ta northernmost tip of India, to Kanyakumari and back on the east coast and back to Delhi, totally about twelve thousand kilometers. About sixteen major events will happen on the way. So those of you who can drive in India <laughs> because it takes a different level of skill. If you wish to be a part of that, we will do this rally of a certain number of people. Some can ride on an electric bus, rest can drive. Uh, there'll be probably two or four electric buses and maybe twenty-five to fifty cars. In each segment, a lot more will join, but this complete trip will be approximately twenty-five cars and two buses probably. It'll be finalized later. But there will be major events in all the cities to raise the awareness about the rivers in India. So we want to invo involve the entire population in the cities, there'll be river, uh, you know, river-related quizzes for the children, people will run for the rivers, people will cycle for the rivers, people will do all kinds of things for rivers on that day when the event comes to that city. And above all, to make a policy document and when we come back to Delhi, we're having a conference where we present this along with the chief ministers of many states, we're going to sign a river accord as to what the policy should be about rivers. Even now, different states are fighting with each other for river waters, not realizing that in another fifteen, twenty years, there may be nothing to fight about. Yes, it's a serious situation. So, uh, this is going to happen if some of you wish to participate in this. It's going to be an incredible experience of driving across the length and breadth of India, which is by any standards the most colorful nation on the planet. Chaotic, but colorful. Uh, it should take about twenty-five days, anywhere between twenty to twenty-five days, I think. Hmm? I'm sorry? Daniel's question, you know, you didn't answer about the school here. Especially in inner city. She's going to do it anyway, <laughs> so I'm not against it, but I'm not for it either. <laughs> I'm definitely not against it, but I know what it takes to run a good school. It's not about buildings, getting the right people with long-term commitment. To well-being of children, 
who may not be theirs, but when you have children who are not yours, you have to do much more than what you would do with yours. I need people like that who are willing to do a lot more with somebody else's children than they would do with their own. If there are such people, a school will come together anyway. <laughs> if you live by this silly standard of what is yours and what is not yours, Anyway, you will live in a very small space on this planet and in this cosmos. If you have no sense of what is yours and what is not yours, everything will be open to you. That's my blessing to you. Let the entire cosmos be yours. Why are you stingy? Why are you even stingy in your greediness? At least in your greed, be boundless. I'm not saying generosity, I'm saying greed. At least in your greed, let there be no limit that you want everything to be yours. That's greed, ultimate. That's my blessing. May you become greedy in a limitless way. <laughs> Why are you stingy even on your greed? <laughs> Stupid <laughs> Please. Sukhantaneyadu kedide, vairinurabu unadidavale.